everybody. Um, my name is Carsten, Carsten Thaleimer. I'm working for Oracle as a so-called technical sales consultant. Um, I'm looking after the EMEA region and I'm working on the so-called LVM GPU, which means Linux virtualization and MySQL. And for obvious reasons, my product focus impact is um, the MySQL thing. So, um, before I start, well, uh, this is just for legal protection for my company. So everything what I tell you can be true. Probably it isn't. Um, I try my best, and in case that I'm saying something wrong, I assume that we've got at least a couple of MySQL people sitting around here as well, so please don't hesitate to call, to mention, to comment, or, or whatever. But as I said, I'm, I'm trying my best to tell you the truth at the end. So, Well, my agenda is rather simple, uh, to be honest. Um, it's just mainly about 10 points, topic 10 to topic 1. And I'm trying to discuss things which I see during the so-called health check. So as Oracle, we are offering um, um, a free health check, which basically means that a colleague of mine, professional service or somebody else, is going or is coming to your company or to your environment. We are looking at it and we are making suggestions. And interesting enough, um, we very often see the same things which we think are wrong. Sometimes they are compliant with Oracle statements, sometimes they are not. But um, what I would like to show you in the 10 topics is the 10 topics which my team and me see, which we think probably should be changed. So um, it can be true, it can be wrong, it may fit your environment, it may doesn't fit your environment, but um, just think about it and try the underneath message which I'm trying to present. So before we are starting with the topic 10, so uh, this is a kind of the picture um, since um, Oracle took over Sun. You probably know that MySQL was uh, owned by Sun at this time and Oracle took over Sun and therefore they took over MySQL as well. And these are the releases which we offered since 2010, which was the time when Oracle took over Sun. That's probably not that interesting because we are in year 2013 and uh, we are in year 2014 and it finished at 2014, and that is the status as of today. And especially last week, there was a big event in the US um, from Pacona. And during Pacona, there were some of the key MySQL developer people, and they did press announcement, uh, presentations, and so on and so forth. And we discussed some of them probably a, uh, a bit later. The main thing as of today is a thing called the MySQL Fabric, uh, which is a new tool to get access to MySQL. Unfortunately, I don't cover this, but in case that you're interested, there are a couple of presentations on the internet available, and there is the live demo from Thomas Lean available as well. And as of today, uh, we are at release 5.5 or 5.6. Both of them are supported from a MySQL perspective, or in case that you're using the MySQL cluster, is cluster 7.2 or 7.3, and they are all live. The other big thing which happened last week is that we updated our, well, call it beta product, we call it in uh, Oracle DMR development milestone release. Basically, it's the next big thing after 5.6, and that is uh, the release 5.7. I will come to 5.7 a bit later. And in case that you are interested in what happens next, you probably want to have a look at the labs release. All of these releases are open source, they are available as binary, they are available uh, for your test usage and for evaluation, and as I said, uh, give it a try, labs.mysql.com. By the way, everything can be found on mysql.com. So everything, every resource which I'm going to use is based on mysql.com. So, uh, but this is the status as of today. So we are still developing and promoting a lot of products. Now, um, the main reason um, why you're probably interested in this presentation is you probably have a performance issue or reliability issue, availability issue or something else. Now the, the key thing here uh, before we start is well you need to understand what is the database used. Probably it doesn't care for you but you have to operate the database so therefore um, there is probably a mismatch but try to understand what the development group, what the departments they are using MySQL what they really need the database service for. Because depending on this need, you may want to operate it in a different environment. And we discuss, discuss this uh, as part of the next uh, 10 points. Um, another thing, and I will come to this uh, quite often in fact as well, so performance um, sometimes mean a trade-off between, well, costs, reliability and security. So 
Um, you can have a very, very fast MySQL database, but let's say you've got an issue, it breaks, it crashes, power failure, or whatever, you may lose some data. And again, we discuss this in a couple of seconds. In 99% of my environments, which I see at customers, that is not really an issue to lose a couple of seconds of data. Probably that is not correct for you. But in case that you want to get the best out of MySQL, it's probably a trade-off uh, between the different components. And another thing which will again come across um, us to uh, a slide is uh, be aware of the five eights. So eight rather small changes to MySQL can enable 88% of the possible performance of a MySQL database. But as said, that will be discussed in a couple of seconds. Now, in case that you ever attended the performance session of MySQL, you probably have seen this or a same looking slide. So on the one side, you've got the performance and the availability. And on the other side, you've got the tweaks which you can use to get the best out of your MySQL instance. Now the interesting presentation today is that we are probably not interested in the design. We are probably not interested in good queries, in effective index usage or something else because we are more, or I assume we are more interested in the operation of the MySQL environment. Therefore, the right two, which are probably the queries and the design, interesting for you as well. Sorry, I'm not going to cover, but in case that you're interested in it, I can send you the presentation. And there is even a webinar available on mysql.com. But we are concentrating on these three levels, the operating system, the hardware, uh, the data, uh, the MySQL tuning, uh, and basically that's it. So let's start with uh, topic number 10. By the way, they are not 100% in order. So probably th you think that one or the other is more important. It's just a list of 10 topics. So topic number one is not the most important one, but give it a try. So topic number 10, the one and only operating system for MySQL is. Yeah, and then um, in most of the customers, a religious discussion starts. Well, is it Solaris? Is it Mac? Is it FreeBSD? Is it Linux? Is it Windows? And to be honest, um, from a MySQL perspective, as of today, we probably don't care anymore. You can mention that Linux is the best operating system in the world. You may be, wrong, um, you may be right, you may be wrong, I don't know. But um, I think the main point here is when you look at this Dilbert stripe, you probably recognize that very often uh, you are told to do it that way or this way or whatever. And I think this is wrong. So, well, in case that you have to operate MySQL, and I assume you're all Linux admins, and I assume you know what Linux means and you can operate Linux, well, use Linux. So, in case that you do not know a single piece of Linux, well, probably run it on Windows. And in case that you do not know Windows and Linux, probably operate it on Solaris or FreeBSD or whatever. I think the key message here is that you should run MySQL on an operating system which you are familiar with. It doesn't make sense to say, well, this is the best or that is the best. It really doesn't matter uh, from a MySQL perspective. Well, that's it. So, well, MySQL, as said, it runs on a couple of operating systems. So Linux and Windows are probably the most popular ones, but there is Solaris, FreeBSD, Mac, and to be honest, I don't know the others. So, um, but from a MySQL perspective, normally there's not much difference. Um, working from a MySQL perspective, from a development point of view, um, it doesn't matter which operating system you're going to use. So you're using an SQL state, statement to get access to the data. So therefore, whether it is Windows or Linux, from an um, application point of view, from an access point of view, there is no difference, full stop. And therefore, it doesn't really matter which operating system you're going to use for MySQL. Um, well, by the way, you probably heard there is another presentation about Oracle Linux. At least I assume um, Oracle Linux is there. It's free. And um, as an Oracle employee, of course, Oracle Linux is the best operating system. But by the way, the differences between the operating system are not significant. And I would even say that the differences between the Linux versions are not significant. So in case that you think Ubuntu is the one to go, use it. In case that you think Debian, Red Hat, SUSE, whatever, it's up to you. From a MySQL perspective, it's up to you. So, but, um, and there is the big but. Now, um, in case that you really want to get the best out of MySQL, so you really want to get it down to its needs, you really want to go to the 15,000 transactions per second, well, then I have to be a bit careful because, in fact, Linux is the better choice in case that you really want ultra high performance. The question is, do you really need this kind of performance? So are you really looking at the Facebook environment, the Twitter environment, Google, eBay, whoever MySQL is using? Do you really need this kind of performance? In case that the answer is yes, 
Well, I would probably say, well, select Linux as the first choice. But this really means you've got a bare metal server and you've got millions of transactions per day and, yeah. Well, whether you're using 32-bit or 64-bit, for example, for Linux, at the end, um, in case that you look from a MySQL perspective, so no at memory or whatever, uh, again, it doesn't matter. So you're actually saying the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit? For MySQL? That is not very important. From a MySQL perspective. But let's say you want to address... 128 gigabytes of memory, there is definitely, but from a, from a MySQL perspective, you, well, you use the right binary, and basically that's it. Um, well, I'm not aware of much comments which are very different, whether you use 32-bit Linux or 64-bit Linux. In fact, I'm not aware of a single command, but somebody may correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe wrong. So, um, so, and therefore, I mean the difference between the operating system and the difference between 32 and 64-bit. I probably made it a bit clearer than after the presentation. Yeah, there was, I think there is something missing in that line, but... Uh, Only more difference between... Because the English is not correct, but... Uh, yeah, you're right. Between, yeah. Only, yeah, okay, I got it. Are you Only saying the difference between 32 and 64, or the difference between various 64-bit flavors? It's both. It's 30... Uh, it's both, okay. sorry. Yeah. So I was... Another question, uh, well, I don't mention typos, so... <laughs> question? Statement? No. So, um, well, th the next point is, um, my eyes are on InnoDB. So, before I continue with this slide, uh, who's using MySQL or who's operating a MySQL environment? Oh, that's, I would say, close to 80 or 90 percent then. So, pretty, pretty much everybody. Now, let me ask, who's using MySQL? Still a lot. Now, um, I would ask, well, in case that it isn't that much uh, users using it, uh, I would ask, well, why are you still using MyISM? And um, there is a lot of discussions, well, I'm using it for this reason or that reason. Let's face it, there are reasons, there are still reasons to use MyISM, but the majority of the customers normally is better up with InnoDB as of today. Because there is a small slide, it, it's not really interesting, the values are not really interesting, but Basically, when you look at the scaling of a MyISM environment versus an InnoDB environment, and this is even, I think, versus 5.5, uh, so versus 5.6 is probably even more significant, but um, when you really need a kind of a bit scaling, InnoDB is usually the better choice. So my recommendation always is, in case that you do not need a certain feature of MyISM, well, try to convert to InnoDB, try to use InnoDB and not the MyISM version anymore. It scales better, there are a lot of advantages when you look at backup, when you look at scaling, when you look at security, when you look at crash recovery, InnoDB normally, as of today, is the better engine. So please, please, please try to convert to or to update to InnoDB. So well, as said, in 80% of the use cases, InnoDB is the better choice. As of today, it's transactional, it's full asset compliant. From an admin point of view, it's probably not that interesting for you, but probably it is for the application developer or for the people looking at the application. Um, its behavior, it's a bit like the Oracle DB, the classical Oracle DB, or uh, Microsoft SQL, or Postgres, or whatever at this point. Um, and probably most interesting for us, from an admin point of view, um, in, even in case that you pull the power cable from a Linux server, normally InnoDB recovers from its state quite easy without um, a big interaction or something. So you can normally simply do a restart or something with InnoDB, and normally it comes up without issues. For on Maya, some the story is a bit different. You probably have to touch something, you have to fix something. Uh, with InnoDB, it's normally much better. Um, there's one downside, and that's probably the reason why a lot of people still using Maya thumb. InnoDB loves memory, um, so you need much memory. Uh, we discussed this in a later topic again, but still, in case that you have 512 megabytes or something, so a very, very small environment, well, then I agree probably InnoDB is not the way to go, but Realistically, well, try to, to update the memory in, in this environment as well. 
So uh, topic eight, file systems and RAID 5 is great. And I would say that's probably one of my favorite ones. So you go to a customer and they are using, well, in case that they're using Solaris, they're probably using ZFS or ButterFS or they are using RAID 5 or whatever. Um, but really, from a MySQL perspective, that's not an ideal environment. So let's check um, what I think would make sense. So, so first of all, well, fast HD, well, this is always a good thing to have a fast HD, to have a fast IO system. But, well, keep in mind that the world is moving towards <laughs> SSD, and especially when we are speaking about MySQL, there is a huge performance impact in case that you're, young, uh, in case that you're using SSDs instead of classical uh, spindle drive disks. So if somehow possible, use SSD in case that it is possible. If not, you probably want to use classical disks, but then again, um, the more disks you have, the normally the better the I.O. is and the better for MySQL uh, the environment is. But uh, RAID 5 is typically not ideal for MySQL. This is not really, that, that is not only true for MySQL, this is also true for a Microsoft environment, for Oracle DB, for whatever database you want to use. Because of the checksums, you typically have a delay in writing this information to disk, which typically decreases the performance heavily, drastically. So, well, please do not use RAID 5. Use RAID 10 or use another RAID system, but RAID 5 typically is not a good environment for MySQL. In case that you are happy with the performance and in case that you're using RAID 5, well, then feel free to use it. But keep in mind, in case that you change something on the RAID level, you can probably optimize a lot of your performance. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, using LVM, I think that's more or less standard as of today. There are other technologies which you can, of course, use. But, well, my recommendation is to use it so that in case that you're using snapshots or kind of these technologies, well, obviously there's a huge benefit in using these things with MySQL. I would recommend using X4 or XFS as the file system. The big installations which I'm aware of, one of the big ones which I know is Booking.com in, um, in Amsterdam, in Holland. Uh, they are using XFS and there is a long presentation from them why XFS is the best file system. I would be surprised in case that there is no presentation in the world which says, well, X4 is better, but I see that basically they're both okay. But um, what's definitely not okay in case that you're using MySQL on an NFS-based um, shared file system approach. It works, full stop, it works, <laughs> yeah? But in case that you really need the best performance or better performance, out of experience from an Oracle perspective, it's officially not supported. I think that explains already a lot, but uh, the performance on NFS is probably not as good as with other file systems. Question, yeah? Uh, the same as with ZFS, um, we do not really recommend it, even when it is an Oracle-based product. But as of today, I'm not aware of a lot of options, tuning or something else. That's because of the caching levels, which again, we discuss in a later topic. Um, it's not, it does work, no question about it, but um, from a performance point of view, it's not an ideal solution. Yeah. So, sorry for this. Um, in case that uh, you're using an own disk partition uh, in your Linux environment, well, make sure to use these no uh, access time options, no barrier options. Um, there is always an equivalent on Windows. So on Windows, in case that you're using index, virus scan, or encryption or something else, that's Windows now, well, you probably want to disable it. Make sure to use the MySQL environment on own operating system and make it access as access-free as possible to the MySQL environment. Every delay basically um, means that there is a delay in these statements later on, and therefore it is not ideal. So um, another very, very interesting thing is most of the installations which I'm aware of, they are not touching the MyInni file, so they are not changing anything, which is very, very interesting because they mean, basically it means they are losing 80, 90% of their performance. Most of them are still happy with it. So therefore the question always starts, well, why should I change it? But, you know, um, keep in mind that you can easily get a lot of more out of your MySQL installation in case that you are at least familiar with some of the settings in the MyAni file. You do not have to be a MySQL expert. There are a couple of topics which you should touch, not all of them, but um, even small changes normally typically uh, increases the performance. Another thing which I want to mention here, so uh, what I often see in, in enterprises is that these people uh, do have an admin role. So they are not MySQL experts. And there is not really a need to be um, a MySQL expert. But in case that you want to change something in MySQL, um, be aware that there is Workbench. Uh, Workbench is a kind of our admin uh, development tool to MySQL. And even though when you do not know the MyAni files, um, 
Within the workbench, it's quite easy to change these settings and there is a short description at the end of the settings as well. So um, it's quite easy to change stuff on the MySQL. It's quite easy to restart it, to do some basic monitoring of the MySQL environment. It's a free tool, it's a free open source tool. So please, 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 um, in case that you are running a MySQL environment, make sure to use Workbench as well. It, it really simplifies your installation and your administration as well. So. No, it's it's an ex it's it's an executable based on your operating system. Again, it's on Windows, Linux, Solaris, and so on. It's available, but it's an executable. As of today, it's not in a browser window like PHP admin or something. Yeah. So, so um, well, two, three of the my ini settings. Um, uh, the first thing is the so-called the TRX commit. Now, um, basically what's happening here is um, you're changing something, your database, we are speaking about commits and the flushing to disk. So normally what happens is first it flushes to memory and then the memory is flushed to disk, which basically means that always um, when you need the disk, the, the, the performance of the MySQL environment is probably going down because you involve the disk and this basically adds some latency. Now, one of the key challenges in um, tuning MySQL is to reduce the disk access. And one of the first things to start, or probably want to start, is the TX commit. By default, it is set to one, which basically means that once I do a commit to my MySQL environment, this commit is flushed to disk. And when you've got lots of commits, well, you do have a lot of uh, disk IO interaction, and basically, it can happen in a bad performance. Now, a very easy thing is to change the TRX commit from one to two, which is not the default, so two is a change which you have to do. And by the way, you can do it in the workbench environment. And basically it means that it is delaying the commit to disk from memory. So it is committed to memory, it's not committed to disk, but this means that um, it's normally, well, significantly faster. The downside is it's faster. The downside is that let's say you're pulling the cable at the wrong state, you're losing information. So there is a risk that you, lose, it, that you lose the last second or probably the last one and a half second of information in case that you're doing this change. But normally when you're looking at the benchmarking things, you get a kind of 30, 40, 50% better performance by just changing this one thing. But keep in mind, it is not asset compliant anymore. You can lose information. For those of you who use my, uh, my ISAM, still the my ISAM version, I would say that that is probably a, a quite easy way to go um, to increase the performance when you do the comparison between my ISAM and InnoDB. So, quite easy to do. Um, another thing is, um, I mentioned previously that InnoDB loves memory. So basically what's happening is that after a time, all the database information is somehow cached in the memory, which means when I'm doing a select on the full table, normally all the information are coming just out of memory, which means that the select should be uh, rather fast. Yeah, well, provided that all the information fits into memory. So that is the second thing. And there are two things uh, that it fits into memory. The first thing is that you've got enough memory on your box. So the memory of your box ideally should be bigger than the size of the database. And the second thing is that you configured the you know, DB puffer pool size. Uh, by default, I think it is set to eight megabyte, which means that the database should not be bigger than eight megabytes. And to be honest, all of the database, which <coughs> I'm aware of, even the test databases as of today, are bigger than eight megabytes. So this is a value which most likely you have to change in case that you are using InnoDB. And the performance impact, usually it's, um, again, it's a very drastic impact. And I would recommend uh, looking at this variable. And again, uh, in the workbench, there are guidelines to find out how big the database is. And in the workbench, you can easily change the settings. It normally involves a restart of the MySQL environment, but um, basically that's it. It's not unusual that these values are quite big. So it's 30 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, depending on the memory of your size. But again, keep in mind that there is the operating system and you should always prevent operating system swapping. But again, I know, I think you know these things better than me. So uh, this was your question. Well, um, avoid double and triple buffering. You know, um, so the disk can cache the information in the, in the firmware. You've got the file system, which can cache information. You've got the operating system, which can cache information. You've got MySQL, which can cache information. You've got the connector, which can uh, cache information. And you probably have the access layer, which can cache information as well. And normally, too much caching is not good for performance. So try to limit it as good as possible. 
And therefore, normally, well, you can configure ZFS and ButterFS to not cache the information. It's, yeah, uh, but it's not usual as of today. Um, somebody who knows better, ButterFS better than me, but I assume that you can disable the caching, right? Well, I don't know, so, but I would assume that it is somehow possible. But therefore, I would be very, very careful in using it with ButterFS. And uh, you probably know the old direct option that's uh, Linux specific. In case uh, that you can do it, that you've got battery um, uh, secured um, disk or rate levels, well, you probably want to consider using it. And well, keep the cache as minimum as, as possible and keep in mind that normally MySQL is responsible for the caching and that always have the best effect. So um, another thing, um, MySQL 5.5 and 5.6, these are the official version. Now within 5.6, we changed the thing called per table um, spaces. So normally we are opening a file per uh, database these days, which normally means that I can split this data and it's by far more performant. Whereby on MySQL 5.5, you've got one big file for all your databases. You can easily switch it. Um, it's uh, described in this link. I mentioned here, and the recommendation, in fact, is to do it like this. 5.6 is already changed to um, this table and the release 5.7, the upcoming version as well. Um, topic sex, complicated settings and architecture, uh, cluster. So um, you quite often go to a customer and he's ex explaining you things like master master replication or HA or DLPD and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> normally they say that everything works as expected. I think the main question is, is it really needed? Because when you look at the MySQL perspective, so let's say I can easily crash a MySQL server with a very, very bad query. I'm, I'm quite sure we all have a query in mind which can easily fill up one system. Now the thing is, when you've got the failover system, the second one will crash sooner or later as well. So therefore, I really doubt that all the HA and master, master and whatever installations are really needed in the field. And the downside is that, let's say you are on vacation, you are not there, and somebody else has to check the environment and he is completely messed up and he doesn't understand the world. So my recommendation always is, in case that there is not really a critical environment which involves HA cluster or another technology, keep it simple. In the majority of use case, which I'm aware of, I would probably say that, well, HA cluster, in case that you're running an, an, a real operated MySQL environment, is not necessary. But then again, this is up to your business case. But keep it simple. And as that, well, there is these five eights, which typically involve um, much more performance than before. But um, when I check my ini files sometimes, and there are ini files, two, three, four pages, and then you ask, well, why have you changed this? And then he said, well, I haven't made this change. My previous colleague did, but hey, he's still there. And then you ask the previous colleague and said, well, I'm not really sure anymore. Originally, it was a consultant who changed it in release four dot something. Well, really, in case that you've got the Mahini, you should be aware of what the settings mean and why they are changed. Keep it simple. Normally, you don't have to change lots of things in a MySQL environment. Keep it simple. And well, an asset, do you really need a cluster? Do you nearly, really need master-master environment? Do you really, really need MySQL cluster? Do you really need these DRBD more complex things, in case that you need to, well, use it, it does work, but keep in mind that for somebody else who's not native MySQL uh, admin, it's probably an issue in fixing things, especially over the weekend, only in case that there is a fire drill or something. Um, yeah, well, and then again, uh, Workbench. Well, try to use Workbench. It, it explains the variables. Um, it's, it's a quite easy way to say, look, ah, yeah, well, this is the reason why something is changed. So Workbench is a quite easy way to check existing MyInis and to check what's going on there. So, um, yeah, what is replication and database offloading? So, well, a lot of people are using MySQL, so therefore you probably know the concept. You've got a master environment, which accepts the reads and the writes, and then you've got well, as many as slave servers as you want to. And typically what's happening is that all the changes from the master server are written somehow into the slave environment as well. Typically a slave environment doesn't really accept any write information. Typically the slave environment is just there for reading stuff. 
and not for writing stuff. This is a perfect fit when you think, for example, like um, um, Wikipedia. Well, for 10,000 reads, they have one write. So 10,000 people reading the site, and one is only writing stuff to it. That's a perfect fit. In fact, they are doing it completely different, but the idea behind it, I think that, that's rather clear, that's rather simple. So master and slave. Now, what does it mean for us? In case that you've got these um, environments, that, for example, high availability, because you've got the data on this server and on that server, basically means that you can use it for failover mechanisms as well. There are the utilities available. The utilities can easily switch a master server to a slave server and the other way around. It's a single command. It's very, very easy. And replication can be used for this master-master environment or for this cluster environment. And the good thing with replication is that it is really, really, really simple. You can achieve replication with two or three commands at the end. So that's the nice thing. Then offsite processing. So you do have for example, business intelligence, or you've got monthly reports or something else, which fill up the performance of your whole environment, but still the, uh, the server has to operate, it has to run. Well, you may consider having a replica of the server, a slave server, where you put all these heavy questions to, and the master server continues to operate in an, well, existing environment, so there should not be a big interact um, from this query. So, you may want to have a replication, a slave environment, and the tricky stuff, the offloading stuff, should probably take place on the slave server. Only works in case that there is no write information to the slave server, but it's a very, very common setup, and you typically have at least your databases on two different, well, environments on two different servers. And as I said, it's rather simple to set up. A very, very common example is backup. Yeah, well, I think we all back up the data somehow. There are millions of tools available on the operating system level or with snapshotting and these things. A lot of people are using MySQL dump. You can use it, but, uh, well, the recommendation, because the MySQL dump um, environment would heavily involve the, the CPU and the disk I.O. system on the master server, and therefore there is a negative impact on the master server, you probably want to do it on a slave server instead. So that is possible. By the way, now that we speak about backup, um, I do speak uh, at the last minute about commercial differentiation between the open source version of MySQL and the community version of MySQL. We do have a special backup tool in the commercial version available. This can do online backups, it can do partial backups, incremental backups, it can do point in time recovery and these things which you typically expect from backup. But this is not MySQL backup. This is a spe special program called the MySQL Enterprise backup, uh, which is part of the support offering. But that is something which we probably discuss in, in the break. So, and I mentioned replication and I mentioned the utilities. The utilities are there since, I think, um, as a standalone version since uh, 1.3. Now, um, the idea here is that replication was getting more and more complex, and with the MySQL utilities, you can easily set up the replication. There is a utility for setting up the replication, for checking, and showing the replication. And there is a daemon available when you've got the master and the slave server environment where you can easily switch the role. And this daemon normally runs outside of the MySQL environment. And in case that you really need HA or a cluster solution, well, keep in mind there is this open source free of charge tool, the failover utility, and please use this. Because typically it's based on standard replication. It's quite easy to fix in case that things are wrong. And even for people who are not do not have a concentrated um, a, a concentration on the MySQL product, it's rather simple to understand. Um, there are even more commands, but this is just, well, replicate, check, and show the things, and in case that you want the failover utilities uh, or the failover daemon, it's available as the utilities as well. And again, they are available on all of the operating systems. Um, topic number four, well, who needs security? Um, yeah, question? Can we discuss this at the end? Yeah, let's, let's discuss it on the end. So the, the question here is, well, can we use snapshots? Yes, you can use the snapshot, uh, um, the, the disk file based snapshots uh, and other technologies as well. You just have to make sure that you're in consistent state, but we discuss this afterwards, okay? So, uh, well, who needs security? Now, 
um, later on, I will speak about centralization of the MySQL environment, which I personally think is probably one of the biggest issue in a lot of enterprises. Now, uh, the thing here is that normally when I look at MySQL installations, there are two users. Uh, there is the user root and there is the user admin, and one of them is used from the application level. Now, I'm not exactly sure whether this is a suggested or this is a good setup. Um, you, do, you can use user privileges and you can restrict them to, to certain databases and really use this functionality. A lot of users don't, and some of them because, well, it's delivered as part of typo tree of WordPress or whatever, and there is not the concept, but keep in mind what it basically means, root access to MySQL environment. And keep in mind in case that you've got a couple of databases on the MySQL environment, what it means as well. The security leak, the security issue is huge. And again, setting up security in MySQL, it's very, very simple in case that you know that there's the workbench. So it's just, well, you can do everything on the command line in case that you want to, but there is this graphical tool available as well. As said, it's open source, it's free of charge. Please use it and restrict the users from your application point of view to the users and the privileges which they really need. And there should not be a reason for having root outside your controlled environment to MySQL or admin or whatever super user you're going to use. You may know that, again, that is the commercial version. That is not the open source version. There is a plugin available which can use the underlying um, PUM module for do the authentication. So you've got your Linux, your Unix-based PUM access, and you can interact with MySQL so that all the underneath laying users can be used to get access. But again, well, I mark this with the three times euro symbol. That is a commercial extension to um, the MySQL environment. You probably want to give it a try. Uh, but the alternative is, as said, well, use the workbench environment to control the access to MySQL. Next thing, um, who's using MySQL in commercial environments? So for example, yeah. Large work workshop, and I'm most likely you involve credit cards, Visa, Amex, or something else. Okay, okay. Now the idea here is that once you need compliance somehow, uh, you probably need auditing as well. Again, there are a couple of ways to provide auditing for MySQL, but you may know that in a MySQL environment with a MySQL support subscription, you do have the Oracle Enterprise. Uh, audit, which is available again as a plugin to MySQL. So you can easily audit your database in case that you need it for example for uh, compliance reasons. Number three, um, we have um, about hundreds of small MySQL environments and really um, just think of your environment on how many MySQL environments you really have in your company. You've got one for Typo3, for Wikipedia, probably for Nagios and so on and so forth. Now my approach here is a bit different. I would say that try to centralize the MySQL instance and run one proper configured MySQL environment. Do the backup, do the monitoring of this one proper configured MySQL environment and run this, well, as good as possible. Now, um, you can run multiple databases per MySQL. You probably know this. You can have multiple daemons per OS. Again, you probably know this. You can use virtual IPs or you can use different ports. You probably are using LXT or container technology from Solaris or something else. Then again, feel free to do so. Or you probably use virtualization. And again, as Oracle, um, there is Oracle VM, which is um, free of charge. It's the best um, 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 virtualization technology. But in case that you're not using Oracle VM, you probably use VMware, Xen, Citrix, or whatever. Well, MySQL, in my experience, out of the I don't know, 12 to 5 million installations in the world, probably 12 of them are using a kind of virtualization, and I would always say, well, use it as well. So um, try to consolidate the hundreds of MySQL installations, try to consolidate them and run them in a proper environment. Probably you want to have one version with 5.5 and with 5.6, but then again, run these operating systems as a kind of a critical environment. Normally a few instances per operating system uh, which are probably backup, which are probably monitored, controlled. Normally, the benefit is huge uh, compared to having hundreds of MySQL environments somewhere in the world. Now, the question always at this point is, well, does it really scale? Um, especially when you are in Oracle audience, they always say, well, Oracle DB and so on and so forth. Now, MySQL 5.6 does scale, 5.5 as well. So 
we are in the area of about 10,000 transactions. Well, these are marketing transactions, I have to say. We have to uh, be a bit careful here. But then again, uh, the question is always, well, who really needs that much of uh, scaling? But really, MySQL 5.5 and 5.6 does scale. And normally, it should be a rather simple thing to consolidate the MySQL environment. And again, when you do the comparison 5.5 to 5.6, I would say that 5.1 is probably in the area of 2,000 based on all the marketing slides, but try to use recent versions of MySQL, and then again, um, it should be rather simple to scale. This is, um, as far as I know, based on the latest uh, benchmarks, which is um, a NoSQL option, so it's not really comparable to the other one, and I think that is a marketing statement with a million queries per second. But then again, that's marketing. <coughs> Topic number two. Well, um, monitoring. Now, I would say that pretty much all of the MySQL environments which I'm aware of are monitored. But then again, when you ask the people, well, what are you monitoring? They are monitoring CPU and disk and probably that's it. Now, in case that MySQL is really a critical environment, you should invest a bit more in the monitoring. You can use Nagios, you can use other tools, but you probably want to consider the enterprise monitor as well, which again is part of the support subscription but then again, you can give it a, trist, a test trial. So you can go to edelivery.oracle.com. You can uh, run it for 30 days. And there are advisors. And these advisors are typically quite useful to see, well, do we, from a monitoring perspective, think that there, are an that there is an issue with MySQL? And well, even though when you're not going to use it, give it a try to find out what the enterprise monitor thinks is the state of the art of the MySQL environment. You can use Nagios, you can use other tools, but the main challenge here is, well, please use MySQL as well and really use the MySQL monitoring part and not only the operating system part to monitor MySQL. And last but not least, the Linux distribution-based MySQL installation. Now, who's using the MySQL versions which comes out of the Linux distribution? Okay, well, hard to say, but I would say probably half of them. Now. Are you doing it because there is no other option or because of typo 3 or whoever asks for it? So, so what is the really the need of using the MySQL installation from the Linux distributions? I wouldn't say it's the case for all of them, but a lot of them, like Red Hat or CentOS, when you look at MySQL, it's version 5.0 or 5.1. Your privilege, you remember that I was speaking about release 5.5 and 5.6. Normally, the best resource to get access to MySQL is um, when you go to mysql.com and you download the recent version from there. Um, we do have RPM, we've got uh, installers for Debian, for Windows, for Solaris, for Mac, for everything. It's quite simple to set it up so that it does work. And in case that you want to have a kind of yum environment, there is a yum mysql repo environment available as well for the Red Hat based in, uh, installation. So for Red Hat, for Oracle Linux, Fedora, it's a simple package which you can install and you've got the MySQL part as part of the repo environment. And with a yum update, for example, you can easily keep your MySQL environment uh, up to date. Normally, you do have the benefit of having the latest and greatest versions with security fixes, with um, performance. It's normally, it's quite, um, it's quite powerful. My recommendation is to not use the Linux-based uh, MySQL distribution. This is not true for all of them. So for example, Debian has a rather new version. I think it's 5.5, but please correct me if I'm wrong. But especially when you're using Linux distributions, which do have older versions of MySQL, you may want to change and you may want to use the uh, YUM repository. So in case that you do have issues, well, Google. Uh, Google is for most of us uh, the first source to ask, but please, please, please check where you get the information from. There are lots of pages out there which I would say are probably wrong. So before reading uh, what's going on, well, try to understand, well, why is this or that person writing this information? I would generally uh, recommend starting with the MySQL forum. The MySQL forum is controlled by our support and development people. Again, it's free of charge. And my recommendation would be to always start with the MySQL forum. And I would be really surprised in case that there are huge issues which you can't find in the forum. So then again, um, in case that you can't find it in the forum, please make sure to use a proper resource. Not all the sources for MySQL in the internet are really uh, recommended from, from our perspective. We do have lots of white papers and knowledge-based articles and so on and so forth. For example, setting up MySQL uh, in the RPD environment. All of these informations are available. They are free of charge. Well, feel free to use them. 
And in case I mentioned the monitor, I mentioned backup, I mentioned other stuff, you want to give it a test try, well, mysql.com slash trials, you can download everything and you can give it a test try. There is no time bomb or something uh, involved in this. Normally, after 30 days, you should disable the functionality or the product. But um, at least in the 30 days, you can get very valuable information. Last slide, in case that you're interested. Well, as I said, there is the community version. The community version and the commercial versions from a data bus perspective are 100% identical. This was different in older versions, but starting version 5.5, there is no difference whether you're using the community, the open source, the enterprise or the standard version anymore. Uh, the difference when it comes, for example, to the auditing, to security, or something else, is realized with the so-called plugins. So it's a plugin which you load to the database, but the core database from the community and from the commercial versions are identical. And when you have a support subscription, you typically do have more tools like the enterprise monitor, like the backup, and like other technologies. And this is just the overview of what is different. But the core database of MySQL and most of the tips which I mentioned before are always available um, in the community, in the open source version as well. And I think I'm close to in time. I think I've got two, three minutes, right? Uh, yeah, ten. Ten? Uh, okay, ten. Okay, then questions. So now we can discard. So uh, there was this question with uh, snapshotting, right? So, well, snapshots is a good thing. You just have to make sure that the database is in a consistent state. So you have to do all the flashing of the logging, for example, to disk before doing the snapshots. That is the trick. And once you are doing it, well, there should not be an issue to not use snapshot. So... Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, let's ask the audience. So what is the state of art things? Who's using MySQL, back, uh, MySQL dump? Yeah? I don't know if my, uh, if, uh, you know, backup access part of the open source stack, but I think they are. They're either from Procona or from Extra Backup or whatever, but they have an open source version. Extra and Backup. And they can do live backup of InnoDB uh, data without downtime or, or logs or anything. That's what we use anyway. Yeah, well, that is the method to just do the backup from uh, from a MySQL perspective, whereby yours is from the operating system or from the file system based backup, right? So, the, I would say that there are always advantages and disadvantages. So, so using these enterprise backup or um, extra backup technologies, well, you always have the advantage of having um, the option uh, of restoring dedicated tables, for example. I'm not exactly sure whether this does work with LVM or not, but there are always advantages and disadvantages. From my SQL perspective, it's probably enterprise backup, uh, but then again, there is no reason why you should not use MySQL. Then probably the performance impact or the restoring time isn't that interesting for you, but I'm not exactly sure um, about the pros and the cons for snapshotting. But then again, somebody? Well, yeah, you're right, it takes some time, but, um, well, using these um, InnoDB-based backup systems, it's normally much faster when you do the comparison, for example, to MySQL dump. So MySQL dump, from a timing perspective, it's probably the worst decision. Yeah, but InnoDB backup, the DMI, it's still, it you're right, yeah. It doesn't work. I, I backup for 500 gig database. I backup for 500 gig database in an hour, yeah. and I restore it also in an hour. Um, but you can back it up while it's running, so. Yeah. yeah. But, but you're always two hours behind that. And then if you get an outage, you've got a one hour source of time window before you do that. But you have the logs from, for that period. So yeah. you can do still a point in time recovery up to any moment in between. But yeah, if you have to restore, you have to wait at least an hour before you can bring your database back up. And you can have the end snap, but you would be normally back yeah. within a few minutes. The LVM snapshot has problems when you uh, mix uh, database engines or when you're not flushing to this in your business. And then you need to actually do a memory uh, snapshot also. Mm. So you can actually do a memory snapshot, an LVM 
one snapshot, keep those two consistent together on a pack of this, and then you can restore them quicker. But I think the tool is doing this as well, right? <coughs> I don't know. I don't think we were talking about the tool. We were just talking about snapshotting to LVM. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, other questions? Yeah? You are mentioning having uh, multiple instances of uh, the daemon. Yeah. Why would you do that? And not just have one daemon with all the best Yeah. So, um, from a technology point of view, you're right. I would say that there are probably not much reasons to do it. Um, the reasons why some customers of mine are doing it because they have developers or application users who do want the full root access to the database. So, and that's rather simple to split them on, on, on a daemon level and not on a MySQL level. But technically, you're right. Typically, uh, it probably makes more sense to, to use both databases in one instance and to separate them used on the privileges. But once you want uh, root access to this environment, then you probably have a conflict. You're absolutely right. Normally, it makes more sense to have all the database in one environment. And especially when you look at all this tuning stuff, which I mentioned with memory and these things, the effect from having just one theme is by far bigger than having three or four or five themes. The other point is, um, in one of the slides, I showed that um, in the actual world, in the actual 5.6, well, it, it really depends a bit, but we are speaking about the CPU threads, and the actual MySQL environment has a kind of a limit between 45, 55 uh, CPU threads at the moment. And when you want to hit this limitation, well, I think, what is the actual status? How many cores, how many CPU threads does have an AMD or something have? I, I would say probably 32, 32, you know? Well, even the four CPU machines already crash the limit of, of MySQL. And when you want to use all of the resources, you probably have to have more themes. Then. So, but then again, that's probably rarely used for this reason. The main reason is that application users want to pull access from MySQL environment completely separated. Other questions? Um, in case that you have questions, well, um, Ron, can you please stand up? Ron is my sales counterpart. He's looking after the same region as me. Uh, all sales related questions you probably want to send to him. That is the mobile number. Ron, I was so free to mention it here. And the email address. And the right side is my email address and the um, mobile number as well. I think you will get the possibility of downloading the presentation, right? In case that you've got questions, feel free to ask. And I will be around the next hour or so in case that you want to ask questions. Thank you very much for listening.